Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome back to the show. Uh, as always, I have my good friend James Corbett with me and we're talking about the Beatles. And since it was the Revolver album uh, that was recently released, we decided to skip ahead and not do our singles thing. And we're gonna uh, talk about uh, a song off Revolver, which is uh, Dr. Robert. Hi, James. Hi, Vinny. Thanks for having me back on this illustrious program it's been a while and yes as people might have seen in the background of some of my recent videos yes i did get not just the revolver deluxe edition but the B the japanese one which comes with a japanese translation of the fancy schmancy book so there you go i'm all ready yeah 50 years from now on ebay that's going to be worth a million <laughs> bucks so there you go right? assuming my my kids don't use it as frisbee <laughs> yeah. as uh, we did with my my parents' Beatles records back in the day. <laughs> Their right. original Literally. Parlophone pressings. <laughs> oh, my God, right? <laughs> oh, well. You yeah. live and you learn. <laughs> and now we know. I mean, those records are so valuable at this point, you know. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, so when, before we, we get into Dr. Robert, let's, do you mind if we talk a little bit about the Revolver record in general? In general because... This truly is my Desert Island record. This is the one I would take with me. So, um, and, well, wh what are your feelings about the Revolver record? Uh, this was is definitely, favorite, when I became a Beatles fan back in my teenagers, this was definitely the first album that I really latched onto. And for many, many years, it was my favorite. It has been eclipsed by Abbey Road. Abbey Road would be my Desert Island disc. But Revolver is up there. If someone says it's their favorite album, I definitely wouldn't argue with them. Yeah, yeah. And I understand why you love Abbey Road, too. It's it's just, it's their magnum opus, really, you know. I just, the reason I love Revolver so much is because there's an even quality to all the musicians in the band, like their input to the band. I mean, after all, George had three songs on this record, right? Here, there, and everywhere is is sli slightly out of character for the record, and so it has gotten into my life. You know, and because so is Yellow has Submarine. Kind of deep, kind <laughs> I would of philosophical say. quality to what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. It's kind of psychedelic and and weird enough. You know, that it's a kind of Beatlesy thing to do, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I I I think the record is remarkable and just because i think that paul's songs don't necessarily fit the character of the record and i think got to get you into my life would have fit the character of the record if they went with their original approach with it uh you know that you hear on an anthology and uh probably on this record you know they were doing uh, you know all those little best kind of little harmony things that were very kind of psychedelic and droney and indian and the song they were using the harmonium, harmonium, harmonium to get uh, for that section, so uh, could have been that way. But it's awesome. It's an awesome record. I love every song on that record. So yeah. So here we are doing Dr. Robert and uh, James. Did you uh, did you look into some of the the history of the song? Sure, sure, I did. In fact, of course, the uh, deluxe edition comes with the the book with a write-up on each song and its recording and all of that. So uh, why don't we just get a little bit of the background before we dive into the music theory for the diehards out there. Um, but of course, what is this song about? It's about a doctor who goes around healing the sick. Oh wait, no, it's about drugs, of course. <laughs> so that is what most of the commentary on this track is usually about. And this book, Bible here is no exception. It's uh, says, with Revolver, the subject matter of the Beatles songs was widened to include topics that were far removed from the usual romantic focus in pop music. By this point in the album, a varied cast of characters had been introduced. A voracious tax man, the lonely people Eleanor Rigby and Father Mackenzie, a crew of jolly submariners and submariners, and a girl saying that she knew what it was like to be dead. Uh, they were joined by Dr. Robert, and there would be more to come in 1967. Uh, Sergeant Pepper, Billy Shears, Lucy in the Sky, Mr. Kite, and Rita the Meter Maid. Uh, John and I thought it was a funny idea, Paul recalled. 
the fantasy doctor who could fix you up by giving you drugs. It was a parody on that idea. It's just a piss take. Uh, the song is indeed tongue-in-cheek with witty wordplay and wry jokes. This being a song by the Beatles, however, there has been much, much speculation about whether Dr. Robert is based on a real person. There were knowing looks in 1966 from the London avant-garde crowd who thought the song must be about the art dealer and friend of the Beatles, Robert Fraser. Although Barry Miles, who moved within this coterie, acknowledges Robert Fraser was a walking pharmacy, uh, he attributes the inspiration of, for the character to Dr. Robert Freeman. In the 1960s, a large number of high-profile and wealthy clients would visit the Upper East Side Manhattan clinic of the German-born doctor, to receive a vitamin B12 shot mixed with a heavy dose of methadrine. As far as I know, neither John nor I ever went to a doctor for those kinds of things, Paul stated, but there was a fashion for it, and there still is. Change your blood and have a vitamin shot, and you'll feel better. One line, my friend works for the National Health, uh, locates the character in the UK rather than New York, while another phrase, take a drink from his special cup, is cited by some as a reference to the dental experience shared by John and George uh, when their coffee was spiked with LSD mm, in London in 1965. Right, right, right. And then it goes into a little bit about the uh, the recording and production of the song itself, but we can get yeah. into that as needed. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's the way I think Lennon's mind worked is that there was a sort of vague quality, like when you take something like Dr. Robert, it's kind of an amalgam of different influences that, that make the song happen. And John used to laugh at people that read all these, you know, yeah. secret messages into the songs. But, you know, he also said, well, it's poetry. You interpret it the way you want. And it's, if it's true for you, then it's true. Yeah. You know, so. But uh, I do uh, also think a lot about like ring my friend. I said you'd call Dr. Robert which is kind of an odd ball mm. way to put a yeah. lyric together. Yeah. Right. It is. It is. But I think it, it nicely kind of throws you off a little bit. It is a mm -hmm. weird way of saying that. And it sort of, I guess, gets you into the mood, I think for the song. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, call my friend, Dr. Robert is what he's saying. Yeah, exactly. More or less, you know, but it, I like that. I like the kind of obtuse quality of, of that opening line. And then the way that the, the next line uh, doesn't quite fit the meter in a way. It kind of overshoots a little bit, but it it still works. It's yeah. Again, it kind of th subtly throws you off. You know what? I had noticed that, but you're totally right about that. It is. It's kind of odd timing. You'll be um, there anytime time. at all, Doctor Robert. It's like yeah. It was this jumble of words. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking like here is the deal and influence in John, and when he sings. Uh, let me see what's that. He'll make you a better man. It, you, you mm. That's a Dylan thing. That mm. you, right? Mm. But like, if you listen to it, you could tell he could have gone full Dylan with it, but mm. he didn't. Yeah. And I think yeah. he was just being self-conscious. Like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> and and the Paul's harmony on that is something. I don't know what what that is, but it's a certain type of voice. We are going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't actually, I took a little bit of time to try to nail down the notes. I could play them separately, but not both at the same time on guitar. But we'll uh, we'll get into that a little bit, too. Um, and that's part of this whole thesis I have about the fifth step of the scale of a major key is where the seventh chord lies. And when we look at the chords in the song, it's, there's a ton of seventh chords. It starts on an A7. <laughs> Then goes to F sharp seven, does the same lick. This is amazing to me, that one little move into the next key. It's so seamless and it works so well. All right, so um, maybe I should just get into that section now. Uh, you know, you don't understand. The first one he does. Uh, Now that is a purely Mixolydian line. The Mixolydian scale is... 
and it's like actually what we were talking about earlier, that um, artificial pentatonic as well, which is part of the Mixolydian scale. The artificial pentatonic would be, um, which probably sounds familiar because the Beatles were doing a lot of this kind of thing. Um, strangely enough, the melody reminded me a little bit of Day Tripper. And I don't even know why that was. Um, but uh, yeah, it was reminiscent of the way there. Now. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Something. I don't quite know what you mean, but I kind of do. <laughs> I, I might I might have the wrong song. All I knew, mm. all I could think of was it's reminiscent of something around this period. Mm. Um, mm. And of course, you could go to Pepper's, uh, you know, but really, it's not that that I, I had in my mind. There's something else that I can't quite uh, nail it. In any case, though, from the music theory perspective, we're on F sharp seven. And the melody is following that scale that belongs to it. But when the second time it comes around, what does it sound like when McCartney's singing? It sounds bluesy, right? Mm, yeah. Right? That's because he's going... Um, uh, mm. yeah. And so he's bending... This is not as common, but he's bending from the second note of the F sharp scale to the flatted third, and that's the blue note. Right? So now, th this to me is always so fascinating. You could take a dominant seventh chord, and actually the impetus behind so much of what I was doing with my earlier podcast with Steve Anders had to do with this combination of European harmony and blues harmony and how they move back and forth. I brought that up before. Um, and it, the thing I want to drive home is that a seventh chord is so flexible when you use it as a root, right? You can end a blues with that chord. perfectly fine as a root um, so, so again it's the fifth step of some key this F sharp it's key of B um, and um, again we have the, the natural scale that goes to it but you also have the flexibility to add a blues line Paul obviously heard that when he did the harmonies, like, yeah, let's blues this up. And you could even hear John, the first time he sings it, it's very straight, but the second time he sings it, mm. he bends the note to, to move with McCartney's blue yeah. note. Yeah. So, yeah, really nicely done. Uh, yeah, so... This brings me into territory, talking about blues. Blues has kind of been my obsession. Can I Wait. can I ask the really stupid question? <laughs> and I'm sure some people in the audience will probably have. Okay, so precisely what is... So you're saying that the root in the verse is F sharp. Oh, no, no, no. Let's... Uh, let's, let's you know what? Let's start from the get-go because yeah. the song is okay. modulating. Yeah. Okay. Right. Which means the root chord is changing from one to another to another. Now, in this particular, I always like admired the Beatles for doing these seamless, sinuous little modulations, as in the one I always quote, um, uh, uh, "If I fell," right? Which is a seamless, seamless modulation. If you're not a trained you don't have a trained ear and you're not a musician, you'd never be able to tell that there was a key change within that. But here we have the kind of in-your-face modulation, right? And the weird thing is for me, the Beatles always get some sort of like cosmic dis dispensation for breaking the rules because somehow other people do this and it doesn't work, but when the Beatles do it, somehow it works. And in this case, we're jumping from the key of a major to F sharp major 
right? Yeah, right. Now, maybe this is because of the flexibility of dominant seventh chords that we can make a jump like that and it, it doesn't really hurt. It, it Actually, it's kind of refreshing when it comes in. It feels great when it comes in, right? But it definitely feels like a change. Like it doesn't... Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, right. But that's I think you know I just realized this as we're doing this. He does the blue note for the F sharp. He's introducing from the from the key of A, the A note. That's the blue note of the key of F sharp. Which is wild, right there. And you know, the amazing thing is this is all innocent. He he's he's you know. Yeah. Uh yeah. So um wait, what was your question? Exactly? Okay, so okay, so we're rooted on A. Then we're switching to F sharp. Right. And it's just kind of weird to me because it's just hanging on that A. It's just, there's no, there's no chords there. It's just A. It's just A. Yeah. And it's a, it's just a drone. Yeah. It's a drone. It's a Mixolydian drone, which it like tomorrow never knows is a Mixolydian mm. drone, mm. you know? Um, yeah. So, um, it, it just seems to work okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I could think of parallel relative switch because of the minor uh, third relationship between A and F sharp, mm. but it's a backwards parallel relative mm. switch. It's a relative parallel switch. So that doesn't work. All right. Um, by the way, James, I'm glad you said you rooted an A and then you rooted an F sharp. I'm glad you put it that way because we're not in the key of A and we're not in the key of F sharp. This word key is maddening to me. A key is a scale. That's all it is. Um, there's a problem here. Like if I if I have an A7 chord, right? I'm in the key of A. Well, wait a second. The one chord of the key of A isn't A7. How can you call it the key of A when it's not A? Oh, well, you know, we're flatting the seventh on the one chord. That's, that's the excuse, right? But to me, this is... Um, if, if any of my listeners are interested uh, in learning about a theory of mine called uh, the, the tonal model, the, it can elucidate a lot about this concept of key as opposed to what we call modes. Um, what, what a model has in common with, a, with, a, with what they call key today, which... Again, they're mistaking a root chord for a key. This is a big problem. I've been saying this for years. The root chord is not the key, all right? I mean, A7 is a root chord, and it comes from the key of D. But we're not going to say it's in D, right? That doesn't make any sense, right? So there's a problem here. That's why I like the term rooted in, because that's your root chord. You're rooted in A7, and then you root rooted in F-sharp 7, all right? But the model, the, what I call the uh, decatonic model, explains this. It explains, it has in common with keys that the one chord, the, the one chord of, a, of, a, of a model is the root. It's like you don't think of anything else. That is the root chord. It has that in common, but then it, it creates, um, how can I say, like it creates, a, 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 let's just say it explains a lot of stuff that keys can't explain. Let's just put it that way. I mean, you, I'd have to go deep into it. It's a lot of geeky stuff, but in any case, yeah. So the best we could say is it's, we're an A7, I call it A decatonic, which is my blues model. And then we're F sharp decatonic, right? All right, so now we, we're simply jumping from key to key, well, from root to root, I guess, you know, for the sake of musicians out there, we'll call it a key. We're jumping from this key, A, with the A7, to this key with the F-sharp 7. Um, now this is this is so cool. Like, oh, I forgot to do my research into whole step modulations we were talking about earlier. This song does a whole step modulation. We're in the key of A, and it moves to the key of B. And it does so in, 
as only Lenin could do it, as only John Lennon could do it, not even Paul could do this. But this is a John thing. So we're in F sharp. <laughs> I'm not playing it quite right. By the way, I'll refer you, if you want to learn the parts to this, the actual guitar parts, Mike Pacelli does a great job in showing you. I always learn something from him, like when he breaks down Beatles songs. He's great. Anyway, what the hell is this? Four, five, one, of the key of B major. Wait, weren't we in just A and F sharp, and now we're in B? Well, it makes sense. F sharp seven resolves to B, right? But how it works is so seamless, it's so cool. I just want to play the chords again. That's another thing. Notice that when we get to the key of B officially now, and we go back to A, it's not painful at all. It, it doesn't feel like, oh, we just jumped like crazy, right? A to B, they're far enough away where you could hear a difference, yet they're close enough where it's not jarring, the two keys. Yeah. That's what's going on with that. Um, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's honestly, yeah. it's crazy. But you're right. I think to the untrained listener, you definitely feel there's movement going on. But it doesn't, it, it's not like, oh my God, that's terrible. It's, there's a movement to it that you can kind of understand. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually quite a graceful movement. It moves along perfectly well. And uh, yeah, yeah. So... So I suppose um, now we go into the well, 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 you're feeling fine. Well, 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 it'll make you Dr. Robert. And again, we're coming back to A from B. Yeah. And again, it, it's a little bit more... It's in your face. It is in your face. Yeah. Yeah. I assume... Was... I, my way of explaining that would be like, you get the magic cup from Dr. Robert and you're in a different place. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. you can come back yeah. to reality kind of thing. Yeah, I like that. I like. I didn't think of that, but that's great. That's really great. And the fact that they're using a harmonium in that mm. section, which sounds a bit like a church organ. Yeah, right. And the whole thing sounds churchy in yeah. that section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Which yeah, I, I think exactly. is great. You yeah. know, like you're going up there. You're in the heavens. Because, yeah, right. Right, because you took Dr. Robert's special medicine, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's very cool. Now, one thing I really love about this is that Paul, when the chords change, he's, staying, he's hitting the B note, the root of the B chord, and then he's hitting the B note, the root of the E chord. Most bass players would have changed, but he's... That pedal point gets echoed by George. George is going. So they're really driving home this, keeping that pedal point going. And I love that. Um, now, I want to talk about. It's not technically a time change. It's a tempo change. It's a. Uh, all right, so we have one, two, three, four, one. Ring my friend, I said you call Dr. Robert. And that's definitely one, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. Then we get well, 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 right? All that stuff. That's simply, how do I do this? Um, I need like two more hands. And since there's a... I'd have you do it, but there's a time delay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work on Skype. <laughs> but uh, 
All right, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mouth the other tempo. So we have this. Da, 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 da. So it's half. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's called halftime. Yeah. And when we do the chart, you'll see this come up, the halftime, right? But what I really like, I realized uh, you have that well, uh, well, well, you're feeling fine. Well, 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 he'll make you. Dr. Robert. Da, 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 da. Right, he comes in with this quick, da, 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 which is actually introducing the fast tempo again, which I really love that. I didn't realize that at first when I, it just came up for me one day. I thought, mm. oh, yeah, right, cool. He's kind of introducing that change is about yeah. to happen. Yeah, good point. Because yeah. it is, I mean, it's obviously abrupt. And as we've had cause to mention many times, both in our lessons and here on the podcast, it's sometimes it's easy to go into a, time change or a, a or a tempo change or a modulation but hard to come out that's always the case yeah yeah that's always the case as a composer that's one of the challenges it's a fun challenge mm. you know but yeah I, the analogy i always make is like you're uh walking along a road and, and there's like dense woods on either side of the road it's easy to go into the wood and woods and like wander off but if you go too far you're going to have a hell of a time coming back. And it's really true about modulation and time changes. If you go too far, how are you going to get back, right? You can get back without a doubt, you know. Um, and the Beatles are just fabulous at doing that, as always. So, uh, wow. Well, uh, there's one thing. This is like revolver in general stuff. But... One thing I love about this record is when George isn't playing sitar, he's playing the guitar like a sitar. He's making a drone. Mm. Another thing I love about the record that always reached me when I was a kid is the guitar sound is so good. I love the sound of the guitars. The real twang, I, it's just beautiful. For years, I searched for that sound. I wanted to get that sound, you know. Um, and, and I did find it. it. I'm, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. Back in the days with my jam band, I I was using my Stratocaster instead of this guitar, and um, I started doing this chunky like um, like. Uh, and I had my treble setting all the way down. And I'm like, holy crap! This sounds like the Beatles. That chunky. More like early Beatles, really, but still, it was it was like I was in love with the sound. Like, I could have sat there all day and done that, you know. So, yeah. So, in any case, uh, George has that thing with the guitar. Like, uh, let me see. Uh, where does it come up? <laughs> is reminiscent of this it's all reminiscent of that like you could almost hear the scale in your head when he plays that stuff and why because it's all dominant seventh chords that scale we were talking about earlier for, the, for those of you not taking my guitar lesson earlier <laughs> we were talking about minor pentatonic versus artificial pentatonics <laughs> artificial pentatonics right uh for music theory nerds like the uh uh, minor pentatonic formula would be one flat three, four, five, flat seven. You could reduce that to one, three, four, five, seven. And if you applied that to, say, a mixolydian scale, you get one, three, four, five, flat seven. And the thing is, this scale has one extra note of basically just a... Uh, a uh, dominant seventh chord. So when you're dealing with these seventh chords all the time, you're going to get this. And it's funny, you know, these seventh chords are very, very rock and roll. That's a very rock and roll thing to do. 
I was teaching um, the Sergeant Pepper song, the reprise on, on Sergeant Pepper's, to a student of mine, and he was mind blown that he goes, all these chords are seventh chords. There's a, not a single one that isn't a seventh chord, you know? And uh, that that's such a Beatlesy thing. They found so much. They really drew out so much from these seventh chords. Really wonderful. You know, I must admit my study of Beatles music theory over the years has made me appreciate modern music a lot less. <laughs> I'm like, where are the sevens? There's no, there's no sevens anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think years and years ago, I and I, I was seeing where music was going, pop music, and I thought, wow, this is really boring stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I posted on Facebook something like, "The problem with the the younger generation today is they don't make use of seventh chords the the way they should, or something like that." You know, but it's really true. These seventh chords are purely magical, and they add so much magic to music. And don't forget, a lot of that is because of the blues. A lot of that is because, please, folks, if you want to, like, really get into the blues and, and find out why you can get so much color from it, I, I won't go into it again, but do watch um, from my uh, Parallel Relative Switch series the video entitled The Blues Turnaround, and that will show you why you can get this incredible array of chromatic notes, it's, and chromatic, again, refers to color. You're getting all this color. Um, James, you know, lately I've been addicted to the jazz pianist Hiromi. And you listen to her. In fact, I was going to make it your, your assignment for ear training, was to listen to this record and listen for the blues and all these wild chromatic lines that she does and dissonances, all these wild dissonances, right? Like... Um, my theory on the blue note is that it has to be contained within a major third interval. All right, so if I have a C major seven, right, my blue note from the root to the third, but that's a little harsh for a major seven chord. It can be done, but gently. You'd have to, uh, like, you know, just kind of slide out of it real quick. But the other one is between the fifth and the major seventh. And the blue note would be here, right? So if I play a C major seven and get that note in there, right? Mm -hmm. It's an intense mm -hmm. chord, yeah. no question. Very spicy, yeah. But Hiromi wouldn't blink about a chord like that. She would do that. And in the midst of this vast array of musical ideas that she outputs, it just sounds like another great thing when she does this kind of dissonance. Um, so this has been another edition of Hiromi Uehara Jazz Appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, I just, you know, I want to I marry her. You know. <laughs> but I will, I, I am going to post a link to her rendition of I've Got Rhythm, and this is a must listen. It is, and just must watch too, because she's so dynamic. It's great to watch. So, okay, back to the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Hiromi, All if right, you're listening, well, let us know what you think about the Beatles. We're interested. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to find out. Do you, Hiromi, do you like the Beatles or not? A, a right. proposal for like Vinny the... may or may not hinge on this, the answer to this question. <laughs> That's right. I may not marry if you don't like the Beatles, so sorry. <sighs> you know, I wonder how old she is, actually, because I think she qualifies as a millennial. And if she does... Really? This is like... That can't be. That can't be. I swear I was watching her 20 years ago. Can that... That can't oh. be. Oh, then... All right. But, you know, right. Well, Asian women, God bless them, look younger than their age, which is awesome. All right. So, any case... Wow. I'm being offensive to white women, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, white white people could take it, though. Exactly. Well, you're not being offensive like to my wife. She'll, she'll be glad okay. you said that. Yeah, right. Exactly. All right, you know what? I hit just about everything I wanted to hit, except one little thing. And this is really a ridiculous little thing, but the band The Monkees. The band The Monkees got their sound from this record, okay? Mm. They, all their licks, around this period of the Beatles, you can hear all the licks. Um, Pleasant Valley Sunday was written by Carole King, 
but they got some session guitar player to do that kind of wild. Uh, I don't, I, I, it's really hard to do. I, I can't do it, but it's this really cool ass lick. Probably, you know, who knows, Tommy Tedesco or somebody came up with that. Great guitar player came up with that. But again, you can hear that kind of in the monkey's music, you know, that whole bit. And also that twangy sound of the guitars. Uh, yeah. In fact, on that note, uh, in the, the Revolver book um, about I Want to Tell You, um, Jeff Lynn, who performed I Want to Tell You at the concert for George in 2002, marvels at the, the guitar riff beating at the heart of the song. Uh, George was really good at the unexpected. He'd outthink and think his way round and come to something completely different from how an ordinary songwriter would do it. To me, that's a magical riff. So. Oh, my God. Do You know, I have to say, like, as great, I mean, there's so many great um, riff that start, riff, riffs that start Beatles songs. You know, I Feel Fine, all these great, great licks. One of my favorites is George's, uh, and that's... Uh, and I tell you what, I could go on and on about this song. The bridge is just beautiful. Um, but yeah, yeah, exactly. And the cool thing about this leg it's suggested in the chords A, G, and D. Just a beautiful lick. And by the way, that chord progression doesn't show up in the song. It just shows, mm. it's just implied by the lick. Hmm. Yeah. I love that song. I, I think it's a great song. Remember um, years ago we did the podcast about You Won't See Me? Yeah. And we were talking yeah. about the bridge in that, right? Mm. And right. you said, you, you were like, that's such a beautiful bridge. And it really is. I feel like the bridge to I Want to Tell You is just as beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's like... There's definitely a line in there, right? Definitely a line. It's very reminiscent, actually. Yeah. Uh, now that now you that you're isolating that, I definitely hear. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm sure George picked up a point or two from Paul. Mm. <laughs> you know, he became a good songwriter over time. I'm sure George's spirit will be happy to hear that. Oh. Yeah. I learned it from Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I have to say I kind of lean toward Paul as, as being my favorite Beatle because I think he was truly the most musical Beatle. I really believe that. Yeah, I agree. But but as you said today, that movement that John makes in um, Dr. Robert, yeah, I don't think Paul would have done that. Paul wouldn't have done that, no. And I think that's why Paul loved John's writing so mm. much, is because he did come up with these obtuse ideas that were. Yeah, exactly. And Paul would probably yeah. go, I would have never thought of doing that. Yeah. You know, I'm sure Paul was thinking that. You know, so it's true that, you know, it's funny. In, in anthology, he, he's like, well, he goes, you know, some of my friends told me, well, why don't you lead the Beatles? Why don't you become the, the top guy of the Beatles? And, it, you know, that was Paul, like, kind of fluffing his own ego in that moment, you know, because, you know, well, no, I, of course not, because people don't think I, I respect John's songwriting, but I have great respect for his songwriting. The fact is, he does. That much is true. He mm -hmm. did have great yeah. respect for his songwriting. And for good reasons. They complemented each other in so many different ways. But much has been said about that, I'm sure. Um, but... Uh, this is a good example. In fact, you make a great point at the beginning of this when we're talking about the relative, uh, where we would rank the albums. This album really was, I think, the last one where you get the sense it was really a band. And in fact, maybe the first one and maybe the only one because George, as you say, three songs and John is definitely here and present and contributing and Paul also. And they're all firing at the top top cylinders. You know, Abbey Road, as great as it is, it's more of a Paul and George album. And John, 
You know, he certainly makes his appearances, but it's more like you can tell he's checking out on the Beatles. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I maybe that's my kind of sticking point with Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. I, I wish John Spirit had been into it, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, you know, I always think about what George said about these two records, because you know how sour he can be at times. Like, he can have sour opinions about things. And... Um, he, it was one of the few times where I heard him say something positive about a Beatles record. He said, you know, he goes, I don't know which came first. Like, he didn't remember Rubber Soul or Revolver. He goes, but to me, they were like bookends. I really enjoyed those sessions. And I think a lot of it has to do with the spirit of the band was truly unified. And they also, they felt like they were moving in a new direction, too. You know, with Rubber Soul, they were obviously, you know, going more artful in what they were doing. They were getting out of the cute pop song, which reminds me, as much as I respect to Dylan, one of truly America's greatest poems, poets, but uh, he said something that, sometimes he said really shitty things about the Beatles. And uh, I think there was a little bit of envy that they were so big or something. I don't know what it was, but... Um, when the Beatles made Sgt. Pepper, they proudly showed it to Dylan. I don't know. I guess they were in person because the story goes that he goes, oh, now I see what you guys are doing. You, you decided not to be cute anymore. And I thought, wow, what about Revolver? What about Rubber I Soul? Think, what are you talking about? I think he said that in regards to Revolver. I, I'm pretty sure that quote is in here. Oh, oh, so, okay, it's Revolver? Yeah, I okay. think that's where, when he first heard the Revolver album, yeah. Okay, yeah, I thought it was Pepper, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, you know, there was an odd relationship Dylan had to the Beatles, like, um, I don't know if you know about this, there's a song that Dylan wrote, I, I can't remember it now, but Lennon was totally paranoid that it was a parody of Norwegian Wood. Right, second time around, is that right? Is that it? I think so. Is that it? Yeah. People can fact check us on that, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's there's some similarity. I think maybe they're in the same key or something, but it, I, I don't really hear it. I, but then again, you know, John was smoking so much weed and taking <laughs> so much acid, he mm. probably got really paranoid, mm. you know. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, since we're talking about Revolver generally, um, your thoughts on the new mix? Yeah, I'm still, to be honest with you, James, I'm still assessing it. I, you heard from me last week, and I said, uh, you know what? I don't like this mix at all, and I was all stodgy about it. But today I AB'd uh, Dr. Robert, you know, with the new mix, and actually the vocals sound awesome, and the drums are really, really, they stand out now. You can hear Ringo, which is a great thing. So uh, I'm, I'm going to have to AB a lot of these songs and just see how I feel. At first, I thought that some of George's parts, I thought it was in this song, actually, were they came out too, too far out in the mix. And you could hear the flaws in it. And for, for me, it kind of took them off their high pedestal and made them human beings again, you know, to hear it like that. And I, I was saying that, that Martin's, I think George Martin's intent was to kind of bury that guitar to give it right. that droney Indian thing that they were yeah. trying to get, you know. Right. It shouldn't be clean and out front, you know. Mm. But, but again, upon listening I, today, you're rethinking that? Yeah, no, I'm rethinking it. I had a very pleasant experience listening to the uh, remix of this particular song. Maybe this wasn't the song I had, I had an issue with. I, I thought it had been Dr. Robert, but maybe it's another song. It could be, uh, it could be on your bird can sing. I, I, I'm going to have to A-B the whole thing and, mm -hmm. you know, check it out. Okay. Let us know next time. Yeah. See, now, if we were doing a live stream <laughs> and we had a chat room, right? <laughs> I was going to say we're good. Like, we're good to go for tonight. But I was, I was going to say, do you want me to, you guys, to show you the chart and play the, the song with the chart? So I'm going to have to ask you, James. Do you want me to do that, or is it, is it necessary? We uh, can do it's it? not necessary for me. Let's put it that way. Okay. 
Then uh, I'd say we let's leave it at that because the chart itself is kind of geeky, and I'd have to explain a lot of things about yeah, you I know the junk. I don't like thing. to think of you wasting your time making it, but um, if there's anything that we need to know from it. Well, the good thing is I have plenty of students, and uh, a lot of them like the Beatles, so if they want to learn that song, I have a chart for them already made. So Was that a, a hint, hint, hint to me for our next lesson? <laughs> 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 I can, I get it. Okay, all right. <laughs> it wasn't, but if you're taking it like that, maybe it's appropriate. Speaking of which, for people out there who don't know, Vinny does lessons. And if you want to take him up on that, I suggest you do, because he's a good teacher. And you don't have to come to my place, or no. I don't have to come to yours. James, you yeah. live in Japan. No, you fly out to Japan every week, right? Yeah, right. Uh, I actually had someone fly me up for, to Seattle to give his son lessons. Wow. Yeah, every, for a weekend. Every week it was like or a, every month or what? No, it was a weekend seminar type um, thing where, you know, it's like, yeah. Well, if anyone wants to do that, I'm sure you'd be happy. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't like traveling anymore oh, these days. Right. But, yeah, okay. You know. Well, maybe if it's first class on your private jet, he'll, he'll first think class on my private jet. I could do that. I mean, you know, <laughs> I guess there is no are... class on a private jet. See, I'm showing my my lack of uh, right. eliteness here. <laughs> well, no, if I got a, on a private jet, I have no class, so I, it would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is what people really tune in for. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, I hope everybody, I uh, hope you liked the show tonight, and I had a lot of fun, um, and uh, yeah. Oh, uh, quick apology, I, yeah, uh, I haven't put out a video in quite some time, I've been uploading some of my performances, but uh, I'm sorry there's been such a, a lag, um, I got sick for a bunch of weeks, and James and I have spent weeks like bouncing back and forth when we could align our schedules to do this, so... I'm sorry for the the long wait, but uh, I'm glad we did this tonight. We'll get back into the routine. I'm awesome. Sure. And we'll be back yeah. next time with whatever we were going to do last time. We'll have to look it up, but <laughs> we'll be back. Right. All right. Yeah. Back on yeah. schedule. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, I'll see you, James. And uh, happy holidays, everyone. Enjoy the happy season. And may it be joyful and peaceful for you all. Amen. See you next time. Amen. Next time.